So we've been going through the book of Hebrews uh, on Sunday mornings. And uh, as we've been going through the book of Hebrews, we have gotten into chapter number 12. And uh, we've learned a lot as we've walked through the book of Hebrews. I have kind of joked about how long it has take, taken us to get through. But the reality is this, uh, and we said this kind of early on, uh, we're not just going to quickly pass through a book just because it's like, oh, okay, well, we need to move on to something else. If we open up God's Word and we study God's Word, then He's going to see fit to teach us. And, and so we're not just bouncing all over the place. And I think what we have found is, wow, as we look at an entire book, and the book of Hebrews is certainly one of those books that is very rich in, in truth. It's, it's challenging to every believer in Jesus Christ. It, it also is challenging to those who have not yet chosen to place their faith in Jesus. And, and so we've learned a lot as we've gone through the book of Hebrews. We've, we've gone through Hebrews 11, which a lot of people would kind of designate as the hall of faith, if you will. And uh, as we've gotten out of Hebrews chapter number 11 and into chapter number 12, uh, we are challenged. And one of the reasons that I like preaching through a book is that the passage that I'm going to preach today, I would not choose to preach. Like, if I was just to sit down and I was to, to study, I, I probably wouldn't choose this passage, because this is not what I would necessarily say is an easy passage. And uh, Pastor Kirk would know this. Uh, we like things that preach. And uh, we like, oh, wait, hey, I can make a point out of that. Like that, that'll preach right there. If you've ever been around a pastor, every once in a while you'll hear him say something. Now that'll preach. That'll preach. Now, this passage preaches because all of God's word speaks. And uh, God wants us to learn. And I really believe that if you'll hang in there through today's message, that this can be transformational not only for today, but going forward. And uh, we're just going get to get right into it. I'm going to back up into chapter number 10 and just do a very quick review because the end of chapter number 10 leads into chapter number 11. And as you get into chapter number 11, that sets the stage for chapter number 12. But chapter number 12 only makes sense if you understand chapter number 10. And so as we got to the end of chapter number 10, remember we saw this. Listen, you've been facing persecution. You've thought about turning back. You've thought about saying, oh man, I'll just go back to Judaism. That might just be easier. He says you faced persecution and some of you have done it with joy and you've done it willingly But now listen don't lose your confidence Don't lose your confidence because you wish the persecution would go away keep living by faith So that leads into chapter number 11, which is hey check out all these other people There's been a whole bunch of them They have lived by faith and they've done so all the way up to the point that they died And one of the main themes of hebrews chapter number 11 is these people they have continued to live by faith and they didn't even get to receive the promises. And so listen, they kept looking forward. They had what we call an eternal perspective. They had an, a perspective that says, I'm looking forward to something greater than what I'm experiencing right now. Yes, I get to walk with God, and yes, he is leading me now, but I really am looking forward to something yet in the future and so all these people, it says, listen, they live by faith. So the end of chapter number 10 leads us to 11, which is, hey, listen, you're thinking about kind of turning and going back. Don't even consider that. Check out all of these other people. And then as we get into chapter number 12, it basically says this, since they did it, you can do it too. So it makes sense going all the way from the end of chapter number 10, all the way up to the beginning of chapter number 12, which we talked about last week. You're facing persecution? Hey, keep living by faith. These people did it. Since they did it, you can do it too. Now I'm going to go back and read the first three verses of chapter number 12. We read those together last week. And then we're going to get into verse number 4 and on down through. So if you have your Bibles, strongly encourage you to open up your Bibles. If you do not have a Bible... We would love to give you one. You can keep it. Write your name in it. You can take it home. You can study it there. You can underline it. You can circle things in your Bible. It's your Bible uh, on the shelf right back there to my right and your left underneath the word grace. There are Bibles there. Pick one up. Take it home. We'd love for you to have it. I want you, whenever you come in, to be able to open up your Bible, to read along, to study along, to circle things, underline, write other verses in there and say, oh, I need to check this out. I want you to do that. If you use your uh, Bible on, on your phone, that's perfectly okay. You can underline things there uh, you can highlight things that'll be fine but i do encourage you follow along i know i put it up here so it makes it easier uh, but i'd really like for you to have your own bible be following along so verse number one therefore 
In other words, as a result of what we've learned in chapter 11, all these people did it, you can do it too. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, all these people that have lived by faith, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run. Let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And so that's what we looked at last week. And as you think about growing weary and, and losing heart, why would you do that? Why would you grow weary and lose heart? Well, here are some of the reasons we're told to fix our eyes on Jesus. If we don't fix our eyes on Jesus, if we take our eyes off of Jesus, what is the natural implication? The natural implication is if you don't fix your eyes on Jesus, if you take them off, then you, you very well may lose heart. So fix your eyes on Jesus. And whenever we're talking about fixing our eyes on Jesus, you've glanced at, at things before, right? So like whenever I preach, and, and you guys probably noticed this, I, I kind of turn from here to here to here and kind of back and forth. If I find, now we have a great group of teenagers and they would never ever do this. But let's just say that it's possible that at some point in time, I would see a couple of teenagers that are just talking throughout the course of the service. Do you know what I typically do? I fix my eyes on them. I'll go, I'm just going to pick, listen, they're paying very close attention. Their eyes are up here right now. But I'll preach something like this, and I'll just keep on preaching until they look at me, and then I'll give them something like this, and I'll be like, okay, you know, I'm not going to say anything because I'm preaching right now, but you better pay attention, right? And so, so like, there's a difference between fixing your eyes on something and just glancing. It's unfortunate that many of us in our Christian lives, we have the tendency to glance at Jesus instead of fixing our eyes on Jesus. We'll get, we'll get a little glimpse here or there. We'll be like, oh, okay, 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 all right, back to what I'm doing. Okay, 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 back to what I'm doing. So fix our, if we don't fix our eyes on Jesus, if we take them off of Jesus, we have the tendency to lose heart. Another reason why some might lose heart is that you're focused on circumstances. And we've talked about that even just this morning, just briefly saying, hey, listen, we have to lift our eyes to the exalted one, place them upon Jesus. And then finally, this has been a theme throughout. You'll lose heart if you don't have an eternal perspective. Is if, if what drives you is like what's going to happen in the next couple of minutes or what has happened in the last three days or what has happened, man, I tell you what, that's like, a roller coaster of a life it is tough if you don't have a an eternal perspective that says all this stuff here on earth it's temporary anyway that doesn't mean that i just i don't care about anything but i i put things in perspective and i'm not just saying me personally but this should be all of our our, our goal is to say listen i'm going to put this life in perspective i'm here for a short period of time but ultimately i'm going to spend an eternity with my heavenly father and so we, we have an eternal perspective, but if you, have, if you have a very temporary perspective or an earthly perspective, it really can cause you to lose heart. So uh, I just happen to think back to Romans chapter number 8 and verse 18 that says this. Paul, who was writing, he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. So we have present sufferings. That sounds like if we would focus on those, that's a temporary or an earthly perspective, right? And Paul says, I have this perspective. I consider that these present things, these present sufferings, they aren't even worth comparing with what? And he switches to an eternal perspective. The glory that will be revealed in us. And so the question that I would ask as we get things started today is, what's your perspective? What's your perspective? Are, are you living just kind of day by day? And if it's a good day, then wow, you know, God is good. And if it's a bad day, then man, I don't know what God's doing. And, and so everything is based upon the circumstances of the day. And, and that's just tough. That's just tough. It's hard. I, I do uh, premarital counseling uh, with, with folks that are considering to get married. And whenever we talk about emotions, I, I tell every couple that, that, that I'm counseling this. 
the highs are really difficult. They might seem good, but, but the highs and the lows, if you live in either one of those places, it's going to be a rough go for you. Why? Because the highs are, are temporary, and you'll come down, and you'll be like, oh, my goodness, what's going on? And the lows are really difficult to deal with because it's like, oh, my goodness, I'm in the depths of despair. And so a roller coaster life of a marriage is very difficult. If you live like, oh, okay, I don't know if I'm going to love you today. I don't know if I'm going to love you tomorrow. My wife and I, and Kim will tell you this, we went into marriage with this. Divorce is not an option for us. So it doesn't matter what comes our way. We're working through it. I mean, murder maybe, but not divorce. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Murder's wrong too, folks. <laughs> you guys laughed whenever Kim and I were talking about killing each other. Like, who does that? What's wrong with you people? <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. But listen, like when you have a longer perspective or, or longer focus, it puts the, the temporary up and downs, which you will have in your marriage. It puts them into perspective. And, and, and in our walk with Christ, if we have a long and eternal focus, an eternal perspective, it, it puts the struggles of day to day, which we have, right? It puts them into perspective. And so Paul says, listen, I, I consider that our present sufferings, they're not even worth comparing to what's going to take place yet in the future, the future glory that will be revealed. So we go back to Hebrews chapter number 12, and we saw in verse number 3, listen, consider him, talking about Jesus, who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. In other words, take a look at Jesus. He ended up dying at the hands of sinful man. As a perfect person, he was put to death. So consider him. You're still living. You're better off, right? So he says, listen, consider Jesus. He went all the way to the cross as a result of the opposition that he was facing from sinful man. Now listen, I know some of you right now are like, but Pastor Dave, you got to understand it was all God's plan. And, and I, it was, yes. Now, you can do that with Jesus very, very quickly, can't you? Some of you can be like, well, of course Jesus went to the cross. If Jesus didn't go to the cross... How could I have received salvation? How could the sins of all mankind been paid for? Of course, Jesus needed to go to the cross, and so, of course, he, he needed to go through this stuff. Now, do you believe that the only purpose that God has ever had was for Jesus to go to the cross? He doesn't have a purpose for us. He doesn't, the only purpose that he's ever had in the entire history of mankind was for Jesus to go to the cross. Is that the only purpose that God has ever had? No, absolutely not. He has a purpose for you and for me today. He has a purpose for your lost neighbor. He has a purpose for your coworker that you can't stand. He has a purpose for, and you just fill in that blank. So now what if, what if God in his divine purpose needs to take you through a challenging situation in order to be able to accomplish a greater purpose than what you can see? So we can really, really quickly say, well, of course Jesus needed to go to the cross. Of course Jesus needed to go through the suffering because look at what he did. Look at what God had planned. And I know that we can't see and we can't know the future, but we can see and we can understand and we can know our Heavenly Father, right? We can see on the pages of the scriptures who he is, his unchanging character, his divine attributes. We can see them. And so we can understand that God is not a God of chance. He is not a God of disorder. He is not a God who just kind of has to roll with the punches. He's not that God. He is a God of divine order and plan. And so when you know that, then you have to say this. He always has the upper hand. I want you to process that for a moment. God always has the upper hand. You may feel like you're living defeated. You may feel like God doesn't have things under control. You may feel like God doesn't have a purpose and he doesn't have a plan. But I want to tell you that God always has a purpose and he always has a plan. And I'll say this also, we many times don't understand it. And I'm not sure we need to. I don't spend, I used to. I, 
by God's grace, I, I'm growing in my faith. I, I haven't arrived <laughs> anywhere near, but I, but I try to be growing, and God has taken challenging situations to try to mold me. Now, I'll be honest, I didn't like them at the time. And honestly, if there's some things that I look back and I still don't necessarily like. I would imagine if I was to go around this room, probably all of you could, could express very similar things. And I, I didn't like that. But did God lose the upper hand? Did God lose control? Did God stop caring? Did he stop loving? Did he stop? Did he? No. Let's continue to look at this. And so we see here, listen, don't lose heart. You saw that Jesus, he endured the opposition from sinful man. And listen, in your struggle against sin, and it's very important that we get this, and, and I'm going to put up on a slide here. This is not personal sin struggles right here. Okay, the, the obvious comparison, the obvious context of this is that in your struggle against sinful people, against the, the struggles in this world, you haven't yet died. That's basically what it's saying. You haven't died yet. Okay, so hang in there. All right, so the context is very clear. It doesn't allow this to be a struggle with a personal area of sin. Now, we have those struggles, right? But that is not this passage. If you were just to jump into this passage without having studied the previous verses, without knowing the context, you might think, okay, in your struggle against personal sin, um, you know, you, you haven't yet died, and so keep struggling against your personal area. That's not this context. How do we know that's not this context? Because it compares us with Jesus, okay? Did Jesus sin? He did not. He did not. Did he struggle against sinful man? Absolutely he did. And so the context in here is, listen, you have these people who are opposing you. You are facing this opposition. You are struggling. So we see here, verse 3, consider Jesus who struggled against sinful men. Verse 4, in your own struggle against sinful men, you haven't died yet. So it continues on. And, and this is where it gets, I'll be honest, it's like, all right, Lord, I, 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 I'm not one that can just pass by something and be like, ah, I kind of get it. I want to get it. And I don't always get it. And I'm not sure that I've totally gotten this. But this, is, this has been challenging for me this week. I've really been trying to say, God, I want you to teach me this. So we get this. And you have forgotten or have you forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone that he accepts as a son. I'm going to read those verses again for you, because there are a lot of things that just naturally don't seem to make sense right there. Have you forgotten that word of encouragement? Now, we already read this next part, and you're like, how is that encouraging? <laughs> We're talking about discipline, and you're saying this is a word of encouragement. I just want you to picture this. You, you as parents, you wake up, and you say to your children, Hey, guys, got some good news for you. I'm going to discipline you today. All right, so I, I thought that, like, as you started off the day, I'd brighten your spirits. I'd lift you up a little bit, make you feel really good, and I'm just going to tell you that today is a day of discipline. And your kids are like, yes. I, Mom, Dad, this is the day I have been waiting for. As I went to bed last night, I went to bed and I was praying like, Lord, when I wake up, if you could just allow my parents to, to give me this word of encouragement that it will be a day of discipline, I would greatly appreciate it. Like, it doesn't sound like this is overwhelmingly encouraging, and yet we read in the pages of Scripture and we know that it... It's true. Have you forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons? Now, if you, if you, if you get the, the picture here, listen, it is encouraging that you are a child of God. It is encouraging that you are a child of God. And as a child of God, you should understand there are things that come along with being a child of God. And one of those things is that you are going to face discipline from your loving Heavenly Father. And so this is a word of encouragement to you. When you face discipline, just know this, it's because you have a loving Heavenly Father. 
I have not known a loving parent who refuses to discipline their children. I have known those who think that by not disciplining, they are showing love. But the reality is this. We've all seen children who have not been disciplined. And we all walk the other way. <laughs> right? Like, have you, have you been around a child who has not been disciplined? That can be a struggle. That can be a struggle. I, I tell you what, I have permanent marks in my tongue where I have had to bite my tongue at times. I, mm, 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 I want to say something right about now. And like, so it is loving and it is encouraging that we are his children. And along with being his children, at times he's going to have to discipline us. Now, the context here is what? The context is a struggle against sinful people. And you might say, well, how is God going to use that as discipline? Well, let's check it out. All right, so it's encouraging to hear that God disciplines his children because we see that we are his children. And then finally, one of the things that I believe we learn from it being encouraging is this. God sees more potential in us than we ever see in ourselves. Uh, many of you have coached before. Who do you discipline or who are you the hardest on? The worst kid on the team? Probably not. You're probably the hardest on the one you see the most potential in. It's like, man, if I can drive him just a little bit harder, if he could see in himself, see in herself, the things that I see in him or the things that I see in her, if they could just get a hold of it. And so what do you do? You, you try to push them a little bit harder. You try to give them a little bit more discipline. You try to... And so whenever I see that God disciplines those that he loves, he disciplines his children, I see in that... The love that says, I see more in you than you ever see in yourselves. Stop selling yourself short. Stop saying, I could never live a, a holy life. Stop saying, I could never see righteousness win out over sin again and again and again in my life. I can never see myself having victory. I could never see myself teaching children. I could never see myself singing on the worship team. I could never see myself because I just don't. And, and I believe that God sees more in you than you see in yourself. And so he disciplines you. He says, listen, I am going to bring this to you to, to, to allow you to see that, that you can through me, I can, through you, I can accomplish this. So I think that one of the reasons it's encouraging to see that God disciplines us is that he sees the potential that, that he has. We're his children. I don't, I, I don't know all of you real, real well. But it takes a lot to give up on a child, right? It I, I, I can't imagine ever getting to that point where it's just like, I just give up. But when you do give up, what do you, what do, you do? You stop disciplining. When you give up, you stop pushing for a higher standard. And I think what we see in this is God's not giving up on you folks. He's just not. You may want him to give up on you. I mean, don't, don't we sometimes, we, like, we get to the point where it's like, oh, I, just, I wish they'd just give up on me. I'm not worth it, blah, 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 blah. And God says, that's not you. You are always worth it through me. So that's one of the reasons there. We continue on in verse number seven. Endure hardship as discipline. So you're facing this opposition from sinful men, right? Endure that as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. I don't think any of us would say, I don't want to be a child of God. <laughs> no, we, I want to be a child of God. I, I'm a child of the king. I don't want to lose that standing. And, and listen, once you have that standing, uh, this isn't a, a, a message on the eternal security of a believer, but the scriptures teach that once you're a child, you're not going to lose that. But like one of the things that we see, one of the tests that you can have is like, am I facing the discipline of God? All right, I'm, I'm one of his children. I'm one of his children because it says he's going to discipline all of his children. So God's discipline is actually a sign of love and relationship. 
God's discipline is a sign of love and relationship. And I know, young people, it is hard to see discipline from your earthly parents as love and relationship, right? It's hard to see that as like, oh, man, I just got disciplined. That means that my parents love me. Boom. That means that I have a relationship. The fact that they discipline me means that I'm their son. I'm their daughter. Boom. Yes, this is the way it goes. But the reality is, when you face discipline, it is a sign of love and relationship with your Heavenly Father. So we're having a change of perspective today, right? We're having a little bit of a change of perspective. It goes on. It says, moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers, talking about our earthly fathers, they disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. So we see a comparison between our earthly fathers and our heavenly fathers, right? And uh, listen, your earthly fathers, they disciplined you and you respected them for it. Uh, I, I, I know for me, and, uh, and everybody's a little bit different on this, but I know for me, uh, I gained a very healthy respect for my parents very, very quickly. Um, and uh, my parents were ones who disciplined me. And I look back on it and I appreciate that. I appreciate that they loved me and they cared enough for me to say, this is wrong. You're going to get punished if you do this. I knew, I was one who knew if I got in trouble at school, I would get in more trouble at home. So I wasn't so much scared of getting in trouble with the people at school. I mean, what are they going to do, really? But I knew what my parents could do. And so it affected my behavior. Now, some of you would say, depending on how modern your mindset might be, you would be like, oh, your parents sound abusive. There is a difference between discipline and abuse. And as your pastor, I will never, ever, ever, ever condone abuse. You should not abuse your children. If you are crossing that line, it is wrong and it is sinful. But discipline is good. Okay? And I don't have time this morning to walk you through like what that looks like. Uh, to find that line But I think in our hearts we usually know I think we usually know So our, our human fathers They disciplined us We respected them for it I respect my parents for the way that they disciplined me I really do I'm 40 years old now And I look back with admiration on my parents I do I, I think the older I get The more I admire them The more that I appreciate them The more that I understand some of what they were doing that's to say, at the time, I probably didn't, okay? So, so if you young people are like, oh, well, I just am not quite there yet. I get it. I get it. But uh, parents, stick in there. So our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. In other words, sometimes fathers are wrong, right? We try to do our best. We try to, try to say, okay, here's what will be the best for our children. But sometimes we screw up. We just do. Sometimes dads are wrong. But our Heavenly Father, God, He disciplines us for our good. In other words, He doesn't get it wrong. So our human, our human fathers, they disciplined us as they think is best. God disciplines perfectly for our good. And it reminds me of Romans 8, 28. Another verse that is oftentimes just plucked out of the middle of nowhere and taken out of context for a meaning that is not actually there. But it fits perfectly with this passage, which is, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, he works for the good of those who love him. We, don't, we a lot of times, are like, oh, okay, well, God's going to make everything good and easy. And, but what, were we lear what are we learning in Hebrews 12? That actually, through discipline, God is bringing about our good. So God working for our good does not always mean that he just makes our path easy. There's a big difference. Some people, as they read this, this verse, they're like, oh, well, God's just going to make everything good, and like everything's going to be easy. And that, No, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. And so one of the ways that he does that is through discipline. 
He does that through discipline. All right, so moving back to Hebrews 12, and we're almost done. No discipline. Now, this is the part we can relate to, like very easily. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, to which everybody says, amen. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but it seems painful. It is painful. Later on, however, so it sounds like when we hear the word later on, it's like, okay, here's our temporary perspective. Here's the eternal perspective. We try to live with an eternal rather than a temporary perspective. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Huh. As he concludes this section, he says, listen, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. This isn't biblical language. But he's basically saying, suck it up. You're thinking about turning back because you're facing difficulty? Strengthen your feeble knees and your weak arms. Suck it up, folks. Suck it up. Get stronger. Face this. I, I used to get in a little bit of trouble as a, as a coach um, whenever I was coaching, whether it's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve year olds. Because and more, more with my son than anything, if he'd get hit with a ball in the face or in the gut or anything, it'd be like, get back up. You're not injured. You're just hurt. You can deal with being hurt. So get back up and keep on going. And, uh, that's a little bit of a weakness of mine sometimes is that I'm, I just think that everybody ought to just be able to keep on going. Um, hard to imagine, right? Um, but what the author is basically saying is this. Listen, you're facing it, but God is using that to mold and to make you into more than you can possibly see yourself. So instead of just crumbling under the pressure of circumstances instead of just saying i just can't do it you, you, you've all been around that I, I just go back to coaching a lot you've all been around, i can't do i can't run anymore Dad, dave dave i just can't do it keep on running it's going to help you for later because whenever you're in a game you're just you're not going to be able to just say i'm sorry i can't do this and I, I probably sound like a really mean person right about now, but those of you that have ever coached, you know that a natural instinct of a lot of players is to say, I can't. I can't do it. I don't have enough in me. And the reality that we usually find out is that, you know what? Yes, you do. You have more in you than you can possibly imagine. On a spiritual perspective, we wither and we faint under a slight amount of pressure. Or maybe it's an immense amount of pressure. We do. We kind of have the tendency to crumble because we have been almost trained in our minds, falsely trained, to believe that everything should just be good if I'm following God. But Let's go all the way back to the beginning. And what did we learn? God used the sufferings and the death of Jesus to accomplish his divine will. To believe that we should somehow or another be superior to Jesus and not have to go through any of those trials, any of that difficulty, it is prideful. It is selfish. And it's wrong. So let's view things differently. The discipline we're talking about here is not as a result of personal sin. We need to go back to that. God is seeing that he can mold us into something more than what we have currently allowed ourselves to be. And he's saying, I'm going to use 
even the trying situations of your life. I'm going to use even the attacks of Satan or sinful men. I am, I am God, and I'm going to always have the upper hand. I will use them in your life to accomplish my purpose and my plan. All of a sudden, life takes a little bit different perspective. I told you, I said, listen, if you'll hang in there, the lesson you will learn today is that your loving Heavenly Father... He sees more in you than you see in yourself. You're going to see that when you face the challenging situations, it's not that necessarily God brings them to you all the time. We understand from the scriptures that God can't be tempted and he doesn't tempt people. But even whenever people are tempted and whenever they are facing a trying situation, God says, I'll use that to mold you. In other words, God always has the upper hand. I don't know. That does something to me. That does something to my psyche. That does something to my mentality day in and day out to say God hasn't lost control. I might feel like things are out of control and I might not understand, but God always has the upper hand. He always does. And we might push against what he'll try to do in taking even the most damaging and trying of situations. We might push against that, but God says, listen, if you'll let me, I'll take even the most painful moments of your life and I'll use them to discipline you, to bring about a training in you that will bring about good. And it says here what? A harvest of righteousness and peace. I don't know about you, but that's what I want. That's what I want. I don't want to, I, I love roller coasters, but I don't want to ride a roller coaster of life where I'm trying to figure out what's my view of God right now. I want to be down here where it says make level paths for your feet. And whenever it's talking about making level paths for your feet, it's like, okay, you're determined that I'm going to walk this path no matter what. And it says this, why? So that the lame may not be disabled. There are already some who are weak. And if you crumble under your pressure, you know what some who are looking to you might do? They might crumble under it too. There are some who are lame that are looking to you and you say, well, they ought to look to Jesus. Yes, they ought to. The reality is this, is a lot of people going through difficult circumstances look to other people who have either gone through similar circumstances or are currently going through similar circumstances. And they're like, okay, are they going to crumble? Because if they crumble, I feel like I can crumble too. And I've heard testimony of so many people that have said, wow, I saw the faith of that person through the most trying circumstance of their life. And it has inspired me to not lose any confidence in God through the most trying circumstance of my life either. Listen, instead of the lame being come, becoming disabled, we want them to be healed. So as others see your testimony of faith, they are strengthened as well. I look at this family here, and I know you guys have gone through it here recently, and my heart hurts for you. And I know the hearts of so many people. I saw Jane walk over and just give this family a hug, and, and I know that through this most trying circumstance of your life, um, it, it, it's tough, but I've seen your testimony of faith. I just want to say I'm inspired by it. I, I'm seeing that, and I know that others as well. Uh, are inspired by seeing you live out your faith it's an encouragement and i want to say that god hasn't lost the upper hand in your lives he hasn't so here's the takeaways god uses even the sinful actions of others to refine us he uses even the sinful action of others to refine us second thing is this god does this in taking those those painful circumstances and the sinful actions of other people even he does this because he is a loving heavenly father and then finally the third takeaway is this allow your testimony your testimony of faith to strengthen those who are weak father i thank you for your word and you, 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 you one of the one of the verses we read is have you forgotten the encouraging word that says God, you discipline us 
as your sons. You discipline us as your children. Our first reaction, God, is not to view our trying circumstances or sometimes even the very deliberate sinful actions of others. Our first reaction, Father, and you know this, is not to say, okay, well, God's clearly doing something here. So you have to teach us, and so you give us this passage of Scripture that reminds us, and I trust that you can implant this in our hearts and and mold it firmly into our minds so that we do become accustomed to saying, wow, what I'm going through right now I don't like, but I know that God is using it. I know he's using it to mold me into more than what I have seen for myself. So God, I may not always understand, but God, I always want to trust. I always want to trust you because I know you're not changing. So God, I just pray for everyone in here. If there are those today who who they don't yet know you as their Savior, they haven't yet turned in faith to you, accepting the sacrifice, Jesus, that you made on the cross on their behalf. God, I pray that today is the day that they talk to to me or Pastor Kirk or Curtis or to maybe a a, a trusted Christian friend that they know and say, what's this all about? What's, what's it, what are we talking about when we're talking about having a relationship with Jesus? And that they can become your child as well through faith. I pray for those who have already placed their faith in you. And, and the reality is, is that we're all growing up in our faith. The reality is, God, and you know this, is that you have a lot of molding yet to do in your pastor here at Northwinds. You have a lot of molding yet to do in the lives of your people here at Northwinds. And I'm so encouraged. I'm so encouraged by this passage because I've been reminded and it's been implanted upon my heart that God, you you use everything. You, you, don't, you don't ever shrink into a corner and say i don't know what to do with that god you you can use everything to mold us to become more and more like you so that we can receive this harvest of righteousness and peace so god if there are those who have come into this place with the wrong perspective saying i feel like god's lost control i don't know what he's doing God, I pray that today is a day that they can see from your word, not from anything that I have said, but see from your word that, God, you have never and will never lose the upper hand. You will use everything to bring about good in our lives. Not necessarily to make everything good in our lives, but to bring about good. And so we trust you, Father. I pray that if that's a a struggle for, for, and I'm guessing it is for many in here today, that today would be a day that they say, God, I'm going to trust you completely through every circumstance and every detail of life because I know you're in control. Pray this in Jesus' name.